Welcome to Vegan Food and Living's Simply Vegan podcast with me, Holly Johnson, and my co-host, Gabriella Clark. With a new episode live every Tuesday, we discuss the latest vegan news, taste test the newest vegan products, and chat to some of the leading names in veganism. Welcome to part two of our No Meat May month-long special, where we're bringing you loads of tips and ideas, like recipe ideas, for anyone who's giving up meat for the month, anyone new to veganism, vegetarianism, um, the, this is your safe space. No one's going to be judging you here. We are here to support you on your journey, and we're really excited to have you as one of our listeners. Um we thought we'd kick off with some research by No Meat May, which may come as a bit of a surprise. Did you did you find it a bit shocking, Gabriella, when you read through it? I did, actually. I did find it quite shocking and a little bit amusing that, uh, I don't know, I suppose views like this still exist. I know. Well, here we are in 2021 and one in 10... Um, young British men would rather go to jail than stop eating meat. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to know what to say to that, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, I'm guessing it's so entrenched in kind of male identity that, you know, that this belief that you need meat to be strong, you need meat to be a real man, um, there on the barbecue with your sausages and your burgers. It's kind of a real stereotype, isn't it? It really is. Um, it makes made me quite sad actually reading this uh, this study and these these results from this poll because it feels like such an outdated way to talk about masculinity. And I feel like you know in the last couple of years there's been real uh, steps ahead to kind of I suppose override some of those stereotypes and to to offer something different and more positive for particularly young young men and boys so it made me really sad to think that such an overwhelming percentage of men still felt like eating meat was was reflective of their their masculinity what are your experiences with men in your family or friendship groups do you feel like that's does that ring true because obviously you're a bit younger than me well quite a bit Mm. younger (laughs) you're 30 and I'm 42 so I don't class myself as in the young category that this uh, research obviously relates to. Mm. I mean for me it's not something that I've necessarily encountered my partner is a couple of years older than me and he's actually even more passionate about uh, kind of veganism and is much more vocal about his views even than I am so um, yeah from from our perspective I I don't see that and a couple of his friends are also vegan um where I've met resistance or reluctance I suppose in people going vegan for me it hasn't been split by by gender it's it's more kind of just people in general either don't feel like it would work for them or it's not something they they're ready to do um I definitely think for me it's more generational which is why I was surprised by the study because when I think about my parents generation and say my dad the idea of him not eating meat to him is horrific he would never consider giving up meat um whether or not he feels that's linked to his masculinity I'm not so sure but um yeah I was really surprised because it's definitely not something I see within my friendship group or even wider circle how about you my dad is, um, I think he's about 65 and similarly to your dad, um, yeah, he, he laughs at me being vegan. He kind of makes fun of me and um, we actually went out for his birthday the weekend and all the pubs at the moment have reduced menus um, because of COVID. So the vegan options tend to be the ones that get... <laughs> sort of you know shafted off the menu first which is yeah thanks for that (laughs) so I was I I should have thought it through but I didn't I um I just kind of went to the pub because now I'm so used to there being so many options 
that yeah. I've just kind of got a bit complacent. So rather than ringing ahead and checking, so there wasn't a big fuss, I just kind of rocked up and um, they had, you know, they had a bean chili, so that's great, but I didn't want a bean chili. Everyone else was having a roast. Um, and a bean chili to me is kind of like a Monday night meal that you chuck together, nice and cheap and easy. Um, mm. So I didn't fancy it. So there was the whole, what's the soup of the day? Tomato and fennel. Does that have cream or milk in it? Um, not sure. Um, I don't think so because it would say cream of on the menu. Well, you know, I don't want to send the waitress back again to check, but at the same time, I don't want to eat anything with dairy in. And everyone's saying to me, um, oh, just have it, Holly, just have it as if I'm not having it because I'm so strict with myself. And it's like, no, I have no desire to eat dairy. I don't like the taste of it. Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of it coming out of a cow <laughs> so um I've gone a bit off topic here Gabriella sorry but um yeah anyway it was there was a lot of mocking and my dad just finds it really funny so um he yeah he, he's he's uh never going to be going vegan um but my stepdad has gone vegetarian um oh, wow. and my brother-in-law is vegetarian so yeah it's not something I've really come across um Going on to some other some other results in the survey, um, two thirds, sixty seven percent, would rather reduce their life expectancy by five to ten years than give up meat. I mean, that's insane. You're saying you're going to miss out on five to ten years of life rather than stop eating meat. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's it, it's alongside the the headline, the statement that they'd rather go to jail, which is. <laughs> You know, huge impact on your life. Um, I just found it shocking. And I don't know, a lot of the study to me kind of read with a bit of bravado, like maybe they were answering the questions, trying to protect their view of masculinity and how they came across. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just found it strange that even you would think your diet has any reflection on how how masculine you are. Kind of food is is fuel and and you know is there for enjoyment and yeah, I just found it really strange. I suppose the only kind of group or sector where I've seen it a little bit come out is um friends or people I've worked with who are real you know those gym going gym obsessed guys yeah who can't possibly imagine that you would get enough protein for example in a vegan diet like when they're eating a lot of chicken a lot of eggs um I suppose that's the only time I've really encountered it but actually I feel quite lucky that I haven't <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> We've obviously got the right kind of friends. That sounds really bad, doesn't it? Um, well, uh, anyone, if you happen to be listening and you are one of these gym bods who's young and um, fit and would rather go to jail than eat meat, um, than give up meat, then I'd advise you to check out Simon Hill, who was on the podcast last week. Um, he's the picture of health. Um, and also people on Instagram like Derek Simnett, who's a nutritionist, um, solid muscle. And oh, I'm trying to think of some others now. Um, it's all the Vivo Life Boys that you see at the vegan shows. And they're all kind of like proper, proper ripped, you know, um, and they're on the protein powders. They don't need meat for, uh, for muscle, that's for sure. There's also a brilliant documentary on Netflix. I think it's still available. It's about a year or so since I've watched it now called uh, Game Changers, which really highlights how amazing a vegan diet can be if you're really into strength, fitness, bodybuilding. Um, so it's another another way to look at look at the diet and, and see how it can work for, for different people. Yeah, it's a brilliant recommendation. The only other stat that I found really... Uh, interesting from that study I suppose was that uh 76 percent of the men interviewed said that they cared about the environment but only 26 percent would actually stop eating meat and I think only 20 percent would make changes for future generations um so yeah I, I think that that statistic made me made me sad but also opened my eyes that they didn't necessarily see a direct correlation between caring about the environment and the food that they eat. So um, maybe lots more to do around education there. 
Yeah, you wonder, don't you, whether it is that or whether it's just whether it's selfishness or, you know, thinking perhaps, well, I'll, you know, perhaps I'll get an electric car and fly less, but I'm not giving up meat. You know, I'll do other things that are going to help the planet. But I draw the line at that. Well, next, we've got some questions from our lovely listeners that we're doing this for the whole of this month. So please do drop me an email, holly.johnson at anthem.co.uk or head over to our Instagram pages at Simply Vegan Podcast and at Vegan Food and Living. Uh, comment on the any of the images and just drop us some questions. So Christy Dassau Reed sent us two last week. We answered her one on Tempe and she thanked us on Instagram. So shout out to you, Christy. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the tips. Um, and it's actually put Tempe back on my radar. So I've got some in the fridge, get re- um, ready to cook up this weekend. Um, the other question that you asked was about herbs. How can they be used for health and immunity? Something that's on all of our radars right now with COVID. Um, and, you know, how can we use them in some simple recipes? So I thought we'd just kind of go through the common herbs that you'd find in your cupboards. Um, we won't go down the route of Ayurveda or anything like that at this point, because um, I think that could take up a whole other podcast at some point. I'd be actually really interested to um, to delve into that. But yeah, so I thought I'd start with some yeah common herbs that we all have lying around that we perhaps should use more of. So first up, cinnamon, powerful antioxidant. So it's going to fight all those free radicals that are coming at us from environmental pollutions, chemicals in the water, all the modern day things that we need to uh, combat. It's anti-inflammatory. So as we know, anything anti-inflammatory, inflammation can lead to disease, all kinds of diseases, common diseases. So um, it's great for that. And it also lowers blood sugar levels, which is brilliant. So you don't, if you have it with your food, it prevents you from getting that spike and then that drop. And then you go, oh, I think I'm hungry again. (laughs) So (laughs) do you use cinnamon regularly in any of your meals, Gabriella? I'd say it's one of the most used herbs we have in and kind of make use of both through food and drink, actually. So we cook a lot of Indian food. Um, so we use cinnamon in a lot of savoury dishes and curries um, to give it that flavour. Um, we also put it in smoothies quite a lot and just gives a nice different flavour to a smoothie. So with blueberries, banana, flax seeds and then cinnamon, it's a nice balance to the flavour. I'm always adding it on top of breakfast. So if I'm having granola, yogurt, banana, just a lovely way to add can I elevate the flavors in your breakfast and then being huge uh, kind of lovers of Indian cuisine we also make a lot of homemade chai tea Um, so we use cinnamon in the kind of spice blend that goes into um, alongside the black tea with usually a nice thick barista style oat milk and uh, make our own chai so yeah huge huge cinnamon users over here Wow, I think I need to up my cinnamon game. (laughs) Um, I use it in curries as well. And chili, I always add it to chili just to give that warmth, um, depth of flavour. And I do put it on my porridge. Um, Although I'm rubbish at making porridge, I have to get someone else in the family to make it because it's always really stodgy. I don't know what I do wrong. Um, (laughs) Yeah, but yeah, chai tea, your own chai tea. That's a lovely idea. Yeah, we we uh, travelled in India before we were vegan and so indulged in a lot of chai tea that was obviously made with cow's milk. And then it was when we travelled in India a second time when we were vegan, it was a bit harder to come by a really good cup of chai um, that wasn't using cow's milk. So um, we did, we did find it and we attempted to recreate it at home. So yeah, um, really nice, especially over winter. Lovely, lovely, yeah warming drink to make at home yeah so the next one um I thought we could chat about is sage this is shown in studies to improve brain function even in people with Alzheimer's which is incredible Um, yeah it's packed with vitamins um I mean again I need to up my sage game because I I find I find it quite fragrant and overpowering so I don't tend to use it a lot but a few ideas for cooking are sage and garlic roast potatoes yum 
um, sprinkled over roasted veg or in like a creamy pasta sauce. Do you mm. tend to use sage a lot? Not a big one in our house either. If we were, it would be more in something, like you say, creamy pasta sauce, but we'd be much more likely to use other herbs more frequently, like parsley, I suppose, yeah. um, than, than sage, yeah. It, do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of pork. <laughs> I think I have this yeah. association because it's always served with pork and I never liked pork. I just used to look at it and think, how can anyone eat it? It's kind of grey and just, ugh. So, yeah, I, um, I am going to be packing sage into my, um, my cooking and my Sunday roast from now on. Um, turmeric. Turmeric I have most days, actually. It's a really mm, powerful, amazing. yeah, it's a really powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, which is just so good for us. Um, you can just tell, can't you? It's so brightly colored and the way it stains everything, you just think that's got to have some goodness in it. Definitely. We cook with this so much and again, uh, drink a lot of it too. So um, in a kind of tea strainer, teapot, we put uh, turmeric and then the black pepper, which you obviously need to activate the turmeric's goodness and a, a little bit of fat as well isn't it I think a little bit of fat and some black pepper helps the body absorb it more easily yeah coconut oil is quite a good one to to use as a carrier um fresh ginger a bit of lemon and boiling water delicious I'm so coming around to yours once um the restrictions are eased <laughs> to drink some That's of these like teas it. I can offer you a lot to drink, but I'm not very good at cooking. So <laughs> We can get your, your hubby to do that. <laughs> I use turmeric in um, scrambled tofu. And I feel like over the past three years, I've slowly perfected my scrambled tofu recipe by trying different things. Um, you don't want to add too much because it can be really bitter, can't it? It can, yeah. And it's it's like you say, just from the colour, you can tell how concentrated it is. Yeah. So if I do, so basically with the scrambled tofu, I um, I was sort of mashing it up loads. And then my daughter said, can you sort of keep it, can you not mash it up so much? So mm. now I tend to do bigger chunks. I actually enjoy it more. Um, and I use the firm to tofu. But if you, if you, rather have it sort of like runny scrambled egg use the silken um, but I use the firm tofu and it's more like sort of bigger chunks um, and then I marinate it in turmeric uh, the black pepper fry it up in a little oil and then I chuck in some um, nutritional yeast some garlic salt which is my key tip um, really kind of gives it an extra depth of flavor a little bit of plant milk soy or oats or whatever um and I think that's it. And then just stir it around and it just kind of starts to congeal a bit. And it's, yeah, it's just really good. Um, delicious. I yeah. also like to add, I like quite a kick as well. So I use exactly the same ingredients as you, same method. But I also like to add a teaspoon of mustard. Just gives it a little bit of a kick. So it's a, a nice addition. Oh, yum. I'll try that. Yeah. Sometimes mm. I add like smoked paprika or something. I guess you could add chili. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and if I do add too much turmeric, because if you're a regular listener, you'll know that I'm rubbish at measuring things. I just tip it in and do it by eye. Um, I did add a little bit too much this morning. So I just drizzled in a tiny bit of maple syrup and it just took the edge off and just gave a little bit of sweetness. Um, oh, that's good to know. And I chuck in cherry tomatoes as well, which um, just you know, if it's sometimes a bit dry, they just balance it out. So next up, rosemary. Again, like sage, not something that's used a lot in this house. I associate it with lamb, which I always hated. I never ate. But this suppresses allergic responses such as nasal congestion. Who knew? Yeah, I'm going to be experimenting with this, maybe with some Hasselback potatoes, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I know what you mean about rosemary being synonymous with lamb, but actually I really really love the smell and the taste of fresh rosemary um, and use it often in cooking and um, with potatoes for sure and even with things like mushrooms actually more often I would use something like thyme but it still goes quite well and I just love I love how fragrant it is it always just smells really fresh 
Mm, yum this is making me so hungry this episode me too <laughs> um and finally um because as always we have to um you know keep a time limit on this otherwise you'll be listening to us for like three hours um finally garlic who can not mention garlic it reduces blood pressure it's good for the heart and it's really good for immunity you know stopping colds and things like that obviously having raw garlic is best. I love making pesto with garlic, although my daughter complains I add too much um, because the organic garlic, do you find it's really powerful, pungent? Really powerful, yeah. Yeah. I think you... I think you need about half as much if it's organic. Um, But I, yeah, make pesto and chuck in the the raw garlic. So obviously that's really good. And then you just stir it through the pasta so it's not actually cooking it. Um, What ways do you use garlic? I mean, it's just a vegan staple, isn't it? It's a cooking staple, I think. Actually, uh, on the subject of pesto, that's one way that we use up a lot of fresh herbs. So obviously, traditionally, um, it's basil. I blend it up with, you know, nutritional yeast and nuts, um, olive oil, a bit of lemon, but actually you can make a really lovely parsley version. And for those who love coriander, I have to say, I'm not a lover of coriander, which is something I've tried to like because it's in almost all of the dishes that I like. Um, But yeah, using kind of blending that up with those ingredients rather than just having to use basil and then freezing it into ice cube trays and then you can pop it in with pasta or with mushrooms or um on top of soups so it's just a nice way to to not waste fresh herbs that's a great idea I um yeah I started freezing leftover herbs because you kind of buy the plant and then you have all these sort of hopes and dreams of um you know it it turning into this huge coriander or parsley plant or whatever or basil plant and then it <laughs> starts to wilt and you're like oh no what am I doing wrong so yeah I I um yeah I stick it in the freezer as well and then just kind of get get it out I, I think we have the same palette Gabriella because I'm not keen on coriander it's just too fragrant if you either love it or hate it I think I know uh my partner can, could eat it by the bunch um, and the tiniest coriander leaf in my meal, I can I can pick it out, I can taste it. So <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult one. I think in terms of, you know, talking about and eating and cooking with herbs, um, last season we talked about the study of getting as many plant-based foods into your diet as possible. I think 30 a week is the recommendation. And actually using a variety of fresh herbs is a really easy way to up your number of plant-based foods that you're eating and to get variety. So if you're, you know, often cooking with potatoes or mushrooms or tomatoes, using herbs to find different flavors and, you know, those amazing benefits that we've discussed is a a really good way to enrich your diet. That's a great tip. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. And um, we've only answered one question. So we'll have plenty more for next week. Thank you so much for listening as always. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and leave us a review on your platform of choice. And don't forget, you can also just shout at your smart speaker and tell it to play the Simply Vegan podcast, which is something that um, I discovered last week, which is a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Um, (laughs) But yeah, thank you so much for listening. We hope you're enjoying No Meat May. Shortly, I will be speaking to Ryan Alexander from No Meat May. He's the co-founder. He's going to join me on Zoom from Sydney. He's going to be talking about the uh, survey about masculinity and veganism and also just about the campaign in general and sharing his uh, food and cooking tips. So um, don't go anywhere. Hi, Ryan Alexander. Thank you for joining us on the Simply Vegan podcast. We're really privileged to have you here today. No worries. Thanks for having me, Holly. Really appreciate it. So you're in Sydney, aren't you? Yeah, we're in sunny Sydney. We're actually heading into winter now. I think as you guys are heading into summer. I hope we're heading into summer anyway, because we haven't had a lot of sun yet. (laughs) (laughs) It's on its way, I'm sure. You know what us Brits are like, we're obsessed with the weather. 
So I'm loving the energy and the excitement surrounding um, the campaign this year. Have you noticed much of a difference? Yeah, well, we I mean, every year we sort of double our participation, which is amazing. And, and this year is the same. We've um, almost doubled this year. Um, and, yeah, what we've noticed, I mean, more and more people are ready um, to try it on. So it gets, you know, it's, it gets easier, I guess, to recruit people every year, which is which is fantastic, you know, because we need more people to get involved. Um, and I think, too, like, I mean, I was thinking of that question in terms of, um, you know, we were a very small team, but we're a great team. You know, we have really engaged people. And I think that, you know, any campaign is, you know, it's people behind it. So I think the energy of the people that, you know, Guy and Laura in particular who are working with this year to make it all happen, um, um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So that, that energy comes through, yeah. Yeah, it really does, actually. So how did you come to set it all up? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I... When I back in 2011, I saw this um, uh, illuminating talk from Jonathan Safran Foer about um, his book Eating Animals, and I bought his book, and that was sort of like this journey of learning for me, where I was um, basically learning about the impacts of our overconsumption of meat, and I, I was completely shocked. You know, I was just like every page, I was like, I was sharing every second page on my Facebook post, you know, updating, telling everyone I know. Did you know this? You know, I did. You know about the environment, about food security, about health. Um, just the awful violence of factory farming, and you know that's all tucked away from us. So I think for me, it was um, in some ways. No, me may was sort of me sharing my learnings. So it was kind of like a um, how, why didn't I know about this? Um, but also being aware that you can't sort of hit people over the head. You've got to make it um, fun. You've got to make people also have to sort of find their own way. So I guess no, me may was sort of a way of me setting it all up, everything I know, in a way to share it with, you know, with my mates in the first place and friends to, to sort of um, uh, give them the learnings, but also the opportunity to, to try it on and experience it. So, um, and I, I was chatting to Matthew Glover, actually, from, he's from Veganery, and both of us are old Mo Bros. So, like, back in the, mm -hmm. um, in the early noughties, Movember kicked off, and I think... Yeah. Um, yeah. A big part of that campaign, you know, you grow a moustache every, every uh, November... Um, and just the connectedness that you would, I mean, in the, in the office, um, you just talk to men that you've never spoken to before because you're all growing a moat. And I guess just understanding, like, these mass participation events, the power that they have in terms of changing culture and, I guess, also um, connecting people that wouldn't otherwise be connected. So I think I really saw the power of that and thought, no, me, may, you know, there isn't a month out there that that um, is a no meat month. So that was sort of... Let's, let's do it. I, I love the fact it's sort of, you know, it's, it's non-judgmental, isn't it? It's not kind of like, right, go vegan, you know, do it all right now. It's just, it's, it's very much about encouraging people to have fun with it and try something different, um, which is, you yeah. know, very much what we're about on the podcast as well. It, it, it does have to be fun, doesn't it? Otherwise pe people see it as, you know, they're having to cut something, they're, they're having to do without something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, I, there's a theory out there called fun theory that a friend showed me once, and I think it was some there was some little clip where you had people in a train station who had to go up the stairs or they go up the elevator, and um, people always took the elevator because the stairs took more effort. But when they turned the stairs into a keyboard, you know, that when you hit on the steps, the lights or music played, people actually would go and climb the steps because it was more fun. So that was something that sort of stuck with me in terms of. If you want to change people's behavior you've got to you've got to make it fun and you know there's some heavy stuff that we talk about in here so i think um you know uh we've always tried to bring that fun element to it as well because um yeah because i mean hitting people over the head with truth bombs and the reality of you know the darkness of you know of the, the world we live in it isn't engaging if people just look away so I think so we always but, but we need people to get involved and we're trying to turn this into the you know a mass participation event so so yeah keeping it fun but but also keeping it fun also is important for us like we've, we've been doing this since 2013 Guy and I kicked it off so it's some um, year like there's a I guess to keep rolling it out every year you've got to make it fun for yourself and if we're not having fun with it if we're not feeling passionate about it then it's going to come through so I think that's something that we all also have in mind is that we always got to find the fun, the playfulness ourselves um, and want to do it. Otherwise, let's pack it up and give it to someone else or, or not do it. But So I think that's, that's an important thing for us as well. Yeah, you really get that sense of energy from you guys, which is amazing. I love it. 
Um, so you've done some research this year, haven't you, um, which has had some surprising results. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, we're, when the campaign, we're planning the campaign sort of um, plan it all year, but January is when we really kick off the media aspect of it. And at that time in Australia, there was this, um, uh, the media in Australia was highlighting, uh, the, I guess, the depths of toxic masculinity um, and, and um, some pretty dark stuff was coming out in the media. And we were just chatting about that. And we're like, you know, we, we experience that here every year when we go out to market and, and promote No Meat May. We do see quite an aggressive side of masculinity that comes at us. So, you know, um, you know, men who just feel challenged by us just saying, hey, give up meat for a month. They feel very, very challenged by that. So we're like, well, let's explore that as part of a broader survey that that looks at um, people's beliefs and values and attitudes around meat eating. Uh, so we interviewed men and women in UK, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we asked them a whole series of questions. Um, again, in our style, we kept it fun. So we had a couple of fun questions in there and we just wanted to test people's attitudes around, you know, what would they rather do than give up meat? And what was you know, not shocking. I mean, it is shocking, actually, but it's, um, it is shocking. It's like that's more than 70% of Australian men would rather shorten their life than give up eating meat. And I think in the UK, it's slightly better, but still two thirds, more than two thirds. And, and it, 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 it's a shocking thing that that's what our culture is, that men actually feel that they would rather have a shorter life than give up meat. But then at the other side, it's like, it's actually not surprising. Again, when we take it out and I talk to men, and we look at our, our participation, it's 85 to 90% women that sign up. And they bring their husband, their boys, their fathers. And so men definitely take part in the challenge, but they're not the people who necessarily lead and or have the initiative. Um, so so, so it, wasn't, it wasn't surprising from that perspective, but it's, I don't know, it, it's, it tells us we have a cultural problem, you know, that, um, that you know, that people still associate masculinity with meat and it, it, it's such a strong connect, connection that they're actually prepared to live shorter lives and i think the other thing it tells us as well is that probably men aren't taking it seriously enough they probably don't understand the health implications of eating a meat heavy diet uh and the fact is you will actually have a shorter life you know if you do you know not you know not in all cases but the, the statistics show that men live, live shorter lives than women they're more likely to have heart attacks uh they um are more likely to suffer from a lot of uh, chronic disease that is linked to meat eating. And I think finally, this, the, the third thing that when I unpacked the data was, I don't think men in particular, but people in general don't understand how incredibly good plant-based food is. And you, you get it. You guys showcase it, um, you know, every month in, in, in the best, best, best way, really. But it's plant-based food has come such a long way since we kicked this off. And um, every week there's a new product or a new restaurant or a new um, company that's open with a wonderful product or you know so so I think um, yeah there's the, the, this is kind of closing that gap when you we live in our vegan bubble sometimes I think um, you don't realize that you know all these people aren't aware of how, how great it is yeah I definitely feel that what you know working within the industry and everyone you follow on Facebook all the groups it's all vegan 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 and you do start to think this is amazing everybody's vegan everyone's cutting yeah. down their meat intake and then you see surveys like this and you kind of go whoa what <laughs> yeah um, I mean what do you think we can do to address this you know this mentality that men need meat yeah, look, it's a good question. And I think, again, it's, it's not just a men problem, a male problem. It is actually a society or a cultural problem. And when we looked at the data for men and women, actually both men and women almost equally scale uh, a more masculine diet as a meat-heavy diet and a more feminine diet as a vegan diet. That's that's the perception um, that from our survey anyway, and it was pretty con constant and it's a universal thing in the, the three countries we looked at. Um, so I think... It's something that women have to um, take part in as well. And I think, again, I, I, we find women are leaders in the space in terms of signing up and taking the initiative to sign up. I think they have to take the initiative as well to actually not reinforce these cultural uh, norms or stereotypes that a man must eat meat to be a man. Like, I mean, that's bullshit. It, 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 we're, we're destroying our oceans. We're destroying our forests. We're warming the climate. Uh, we're destroying our health. Um, and obviously we're the violence that we're committing on grand scale to, because we want to have meat three times a day um, is we have to break that myth. Like it's just, not, it's just not serving us. So I feel like I feel really passionately about this, but I think it's, we all play a role and I think we have to teach our kids, 
our nephews, our our parents even, you know, we have to sort of just challenge challenge these um, things. And it's quite subtle. And, I, and again, it, you know, it can, can, comes, comes out in the survey, but it is quite subtle when you, some of it's nice, some of it's quite blatant, but a lot of it is subtle. And you just, um, uh, you know, and again, I, I think back to when I was a kid and I was indoctrinated into the world of um, men. I was like, my grandfather who was a butcher, gave me the barbecue tongs and I'm there cooking the steak and the sausages for the family or my sisters and my cousins are all doing the salads. And it was <laughs> yeah. just, like, it's just stuff like that. Like the, the boys go and do the barbecue and the girls go in the kitchen. I mean, what is with that? Like what's this gendered eating? It's weird. Yeah, it is weird. Although I'd rather be sitting down with a glass of wine than having to <laughs> turn, <laughs> turn veggie burgers over. <laughs> I'll be there with you too. I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going back to what you were saying about, you know, not shoving it down people's throats as it were um I know when I first went vegan um started eating a sort of whole food plant-based diet and you know um sit watching documentaries and reading up on things you you suddenly feel like you know you've seen the light and you want to share it with everyone and you want to help people and it's it's hard isn't it not to kind of go down that road because like you say people do take offense and they might not be ready to listen to you um yeah. I think for me I think the, the best way is to show people how you know going back to saying you know making it fun I think it, it is just showing them how um amazing plant-based eating can be yeah yeah I, th I think that's a huge part of it and again one of the one that we've asked people their barriers to to taking on no meat may or, or going vegan and the the three the three were that they don't they don't they think they'd be bored by the food um, they wouldn't know what to cook and they're not sure where they get their protein um, they're the three big barriers and they were quite clearly the sort of bigger and the biggest one was they think the food is boring uh, I think the four, maybe forty to forty five percent had that perception so I think again that's what I say like we need to really showcase that 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 is that is crap you know the food is sensational there's so many um, you know, for every, as you know, for every meat or animal based dish, there is a, a vegan equivalent. And not all of them hit the mark yet, but some of them, you know, exceed it. You know, they're, they're, you, they're, they come with all that flavor, but they come with fiber and they come with without the cholesterol and the, all, the, all the nasty. So you actually feel better when you eat them. So I think it's I think there's a big role to play in, in showing showing that. And I think also when we when we sign up, people people want the recipes. They're doing no meat made because they love the free recipes and they want the food. Um, and in our group where we throw our vegan participants and our vegetarian participants um, and our mentors and our prior year alumni, if you like, they're all in this group together and they're all at different stages, you know. Um, and it's quite an interesting little experiment. But but you're right. If, you, if someone goes, someone will watch sea spiracy or cow spiracy or, or earthlings or dominion and they come out and they're like that you know they're, they're, yeah, they've they're affected and they feel really passionately but when they express that it's actually off-putting to other people who are there i'm just here for the recipes so it's really and i mean it's just a microcosm of the, the world we live in but i think it is a lesson that you know yeah i mean channel that passion into something that's going to be effective, I think is probably the best advice I'd give. But, but by, all, by all accounts, share that knowledge. And, and when people are ready, you know, you've got to show them the documentaries or tell them the books to read, et cetera. But, but it, it's, it's tricky. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. I think it's just accepting that everyone's, you know, on their own journey, aren't they? And we're all going to be at different stages and just kind of keeping it in mind that we, we were eating meat and fish at one point. We were ignorant to what was going on so just kind of being yeah. kind and supportive um so let's talk about plant-based eating then what kind of meals do you cook that's going to prove the meat eaters wrong yeah right right well the food i mean it's all about the food and actually guy should be here for this one my partner who um has been vegetarian since he's nine and wow is an absolutely incredible cook i think one of his X has called him a very good cooker. He was French, but he um, <laughs> he uh, and I. I think for the first six seven years of uh, our relationship, I was a meat eater, and I was just eating this amazing vegetarian food. The guy would plate up, and then I would go out and eat my steaks when I was out with my mates and stuff. So, I I was sort of it was a gradual thing for me, and then I was like, wow, this food is really good, you know. And then and then I kind of got into the world myself, but but as far as now, I mean, we we eat really well. Like you know, we look at our Instagram feed. Um, so we're showing a recipe every day and we try and showcase the abundance of amazing creators out there, which you're aware of as well. 
Um, and also our YouTube channel, we create a, we look around Sydney and find out who are, who are the people who inspire us and, and um, some really great Palestinian food from the Kamza Cafe in Sydney. Uh, there's, I mean, there's cauliflower wrap in there, which is made of a tahini coconut cream and it's got turmeric, turmeric chickpeas and with uh, fried cauliflower in, you know, greens in a wrap. It's just divine and really easy to make. Um, but that, that's the sort of stuff that people wouldn't be aware of. Um, you know, black bean and portobello mushroom burgers are something that we love and they're healthy and they taste great. So we share that with our community. Um, or jackfruit, you know, like the, um, uh, we've made a, a pulled pork style pizza um, with jackfruit and barbecue sauce and it's just killer. Like it just tastes incredible. Um, another another video on our YouTube is this prawn and avocado cocktail. So it's what you know, if you're doing the fancy dinner party, you want to sort of lay it on. Um, this is a, a, a an amazing entree, and it's just kind of got layers of um, each layer is more impressive than the other. And it's got the vegan prawns on top, the sort of um, fried and uh, garlic and um, other good stuff. But but yeah, yeah, we I mean we eat well. You know, it's I, I'm a big foodie, always have been, and sort of um, yeah. So it's. Uh, and I think partly you, you kind of, I don't know, when you, when you go vegan or you sort of, you, you kind of are prepared to give all this stuff up. And what I found, you probably found the same in the last seven years, every, every month or something, oh, I get something back. You know, I can, I can have a croissant now. I can have a, I can have a lamington now. I can have this custard tart I haven't had before. I can, now I can get sausage rolls. I can get these pies. And, you know, all this stuff that you've give, given up are com coming back because the food tech is incredible and the, the plant-based food industry is booming um and we'll continue to so i think yeah that's one of the one of the joys i think is you know the the, you know, the food it's incredible we're so lucky now aren't we although uh, it's um taken a bit of a toll on my waistline what with lockdown and taste testing for the <laughs> podcast <laughs> i have put on a little bit of weight but um putting your body on the line for the cause holly it's what it's about that's yeah that's what i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that um yeah I mean you know we are so lucky aren't we to have all this now and you know when you think back to people going vegan 20 years ago they they would literally be cooking everything from scratch and you know whilst I fully advocate you know still doing that we've got to be realistic we're we're time poor um you know we're we're working some some people have got kids you're trying to fit in socializing and everything else so you don't always have time to cook everything from scratch so um but yeah I think I think for me I was never a foodie I never really was that interested in food until I went vegan and discovered like you say about cauliflower I mean here in the UK cauliflower you have it with a roast and you cover it in like a sickly white sauce you know yeah. never thought cauliflower would be on my you know top sort of <laughs> vegetable list but now I'm like yeah cauliflower steak with the uh, you know pomegranate seeds there's just so much you can do with it and it it tastes amazing yeah yeah no, I agree I agree it is, it is um and I, I don't I feel like all the I mean a lot of the creative minds now in food are engaged with and looking at plant-based foods like that's what I feel that's where the creativity is so that's where you're getting these um amazing flavors and recipes and combinations of flavors and um yeah so it is it is super exciting i think and and i think and the other the other i guess aspect of it to, from us from our perspective you know we, we are completely inclusive we want we think no may is for everybody because it is um but part of that is the multicultural aspect in terms of um the food you know like uh, i've uh, some great friends who are sri lankan and the still the sister is vegetarian and just cooks the most incredible food and so she, you know, she puts kale with coconut and mustard seeds in a salad, um, which, I mean, I call it like Sri Lankan tabbouleh or something, but it, it, it is, I don't know, one of my favourite things now, which we cooked up last year, and it's nutrient-rich, tastes great, so quick to make. Um, it's got curry leaves in it as well. But, but then you look at Palestinian food, and then you look at, um, you look Italian food, and then you look at... Um, you know, there's Russian Russian food, or you know, I don't like. You kind of go through every nation in the world. Like most food is comes, you know, the, the cultural background is it is based around plants. And if you, and if you look at the best plant based eating in every country, and you put it together, you've got this international cuisine that you know you you could have it every day of May for the you know every day for the rest of your life. You're not going to get through it all, you know. Like this is, I, I yeah, that's that's the bit that's exciting to me, the abundance of food. And, um, yeah, so that's what we try and get across to everyone who takes part in No Meat Mate. 
Yeah, definitely. Don't think of it as giving up, cutting out. Think of it as entering this whole new world of exciting foods. Yeah, totally. And and as it, being playful with it, having fun in the kitchen, taking taking that attitude in there as you know what I'm going to learn and um uh yeah, so I can't have this, but I can have this, you know. So yeah, it, it's it's yeah, it's pretty pretty exciting, I think. So what are your hopes for the future with No Meat May? Do you think a lot of people will, you know, continue with it after this month? And, you know, what are your, yeah, what are your plans for the future for the campaign? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, what, what keeps us doing it every year is the fact that, yes, a lot of people do continue with it. So we do surveys at the end of the campaign and then a couple of months later, and they tell us 90% of people who sign up and do the survey um, uh, report that they've reduced or eliminated meat. Um, so that, and it's normally around 94, 93, 94%. Um, and about 56 to 60% give up red meat altogether and about 30% um, eliminate all meat altogether um, as per our survey results. So so that, and then you, I mean, the, the stats are the stats, which is great, but it's the stories, you know, the people's comments in the surveys that are, I mean, I'm, you know, talking about masculinity here, I mean, I'm actually, I tear up reading these stories. They're beautiful. They're like, they've, they've, had transformed their lives they've had you know we talk about we we use this sort of um visual references of revolutions you know like in our punk style um graphics the anarchy symbol is around it's not it's not it's not a we're not, we're not looking to you know tear down um uh governments etc we're, we're, we're just looking to revel bring personal revolutions to people and i think when you read those that's the fuel that keeps us going every year you know so um so i think whilst ever it is having that sort of positive impact on people we'll keep we'll keep doing it that's that's it but but and again it's it's just getting it out to more and more people because as i said what we find every year is i mean my budget runs out by the i mean i phase it i'm I'm an accountant by trade so i'm very good with my numbers i balance out to the first of may then it's all gone but you get closer than like if i had more money i'd get more people you know like that's that's who we're at now the more people that are aware of it the more people want to take part and that's really exciting. So I think that's that's my challenge now is to actually get out there, get the funding to keep it growing and to get more and more people involved. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us. And hopefully we'll, you know, reach a few more people via the podcast and our amazing listeners. Make sure everybody tells their friends about No Meat May and um, get them to sign up. Um, and yeah, thank you for all the work you're doing for the um, vegan movement. No worries, Holly. And likewise, um, yeah, I love vegan food and living and it's such a great resource for people who are, um dipping their toe in to sort of um have a look at the you know how great food can be so keep keep up the wonderful work thank you for the opportunity to to have a chat it's nice to um nice to chat in person yeah it was lovely thank you so much no worries take care Well, I hope today's episode has inspired you to continue with your veggie vegan journey. And if you're an old hand at this, then don't forget to share this with any friends who might be inspired to cut down their meat intake or take the plunge and go vegan. For part three of our No Meat May month long special, we'll be speaking to the guys that run the Vegan Larder blog. They'll be sharing loads of amazing recipes because this month is all about celebrating plant-based food and how delicious and fun it can be to cook. So I'll see you next week.